मॉर्निंग पास्टर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी गुड टू सी ऑल ऑफ यू होप यू आर डूइंग वेल गुड मॉर्निंग सो वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू टू आर नेक्स्ट क्लास आई होप ऑल ऑफ यू आर डूइंग वेल एंड कीपिंग ब्लेस्ड yeah um and welcome to all the uh, e-learning students as well uh, so glad that each of us are learning together joining in slowly people are coming in that's nice okay um all right we are into our eighth week we've passed eight weeks of of our class how how time flies isn't it yeah i think just a, a quick announcement uh, is um um Uh, for the online students as well as the e-learning students the assessment has been posted it was posted last week online students you have time till 7th of march to complete your assessment and i request all of you to please do that before your due date um whereas for the online uh, i'm sorry the e-learning students you have till the end of the course to complete it that is just in case there are joinees who come in um you know in between the sessions you still have an opportunity to complete your uh, assessment by the end of the course that is uh, the end of april but uh, all the students here who are online here with me your due date is on the 7th of march uh it is posted here on the class work and on the stream so just go ahead and um complete your assessments it is being looked into manually so uh, i had a couple of uh, um questions of why the marks were not released i shall release the marks once everybody has uh, or after the due date i shall release it all together um but they will be they will be manually looked at so even maybe at times you may feel your answer is right but something you know you haven't got the marks or you've got additional marks don't worry it's going to be looked into manually by me and the marks are going to um, be allotted accordingly okay so uh, i think there are just i think five of you when i looked last uh, who've completed it please ensure that you do it otherwise you know this counts for your final uh grade so kindly ensure that uh, you take a look at it and it's it's really really easy i'm sure those who've done it will tell you it's uh, really easy um to do okay all right so uh, anyone would like to quickly help me with what we did the last time what uh, what did we focus on during our last class we had a good um um role play last week if we remember we tried to bring about the stage of exploration and uh, that i think was uh, pretty helpful for all of us who were there um uh, yeah so anyone would like to bring about what we what we discussed last week quickly in 2 minutes i have a silent class pin drop silence you know this is the time when you're actually in class and the teacher asks a question you will find students looking down you know here you have the screens to cover you so you don't have to look down you have to can boldly look at my face <laughs> yeah so who'd like to okay someone said uh avni i think uh yeah okay sounds that we looked at brother samuel's case study that's right and uh, we apni says yes we did um self uh, uh uh understanding and action yes we looked at goals we looked at smart goals okay good good uh, i'm so glad that uh, there are there are some of us who are thinking or at least who's looking back at the notes and trying to figure out what we did last time so good anything else anything else 
problem identification okay okay that was i think in the previous class that was uh and the previous class okay the foreign objects is oh anita i think you've missed we're not at uh, we're not at emotional wholeness we're at christian counseling today <laughs> okay yeah okay just fam no no problem no problem just a familiar face for a double subject can happen not not a problem okay any anything else anyone else um what else did we learn uh initiating intervention to reach desired goals yes the third phase where we spoke about you know action points where we get into um action yes absolutely that's that's good okay anything more anything else anyone can think of that we've done okay all right so that's that's good that's um that's something um, at least we've kind of jogged our memory okay so we're going to go on to um the the part of we we looked at the process <clears throat> what are the stages that uh, uh, take place in a counseling process today we from from now to a couple of weeks ahead we are going to be looking at what are the skills a counselor uses to ensure that this process of self exploration self understanding of action takes place in the counseling so what what are some of the skills that a counselor needs to have in order to get the person move from a place of um a problem to a place of finding their solution okay and what are the tools and the techniques or the skills that we use in order to get the counselee to that place so that's what we are going to start off from today and um this is what we call as micro skills okay uh, just give me a minute let me i'm i'm just going to um oh, sorry i'm just going to share my screen sorry sorry apologies Uh, just give me a minute. I think I'm facing some issue. This is not for some reason. Are you all able to hear me? Because my screen seems to be stuck. Yes, ma'am. We can yes, hear. Okay. All right, I'm just going to log out and I'm going to log in. Okay, I think there's something wrong with my system. I'm just going to log out and log in. I'll be back. Are you all able to see my screen right now? Yes, Pastor. Okay, okay, right. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the um, we, like I said, we looked at the process of what happens in counseling, the stages that happen in counseling, and we're going to be looking at skills that a counselor needs to use for a counselee to move from that phase of exploration to a to a place of action and that's what we call as as you can see here is what is called as micro skills okay now um the 
uh, what what is that counseling relationship we've, we've been talking about the counseling relationship we also said that you know there are certain attributes that is required in the counseling relationship now this relationship uh, really talks of what a counselor and a counsellee share and it is the quality and the strength of the connection that the counsellor and the counsellee shares. That's what a counselling relationship is. So when you look at a counselling relationship, it consists of two things, okay? Sorry, there's something wrong with my screen and that's why there are half the words are also not there for some reason. Okay, it's, it's the counsellor's relationship with the counsellee. Okay, so that's the word there. I apologize, there's, uh, there's something going on here. Yeah, so the counselor's relationship with the counselee is one part, and the counselee's relationship with the counselor is the is the other other part of it. And what what is it that's that uh, that you see in between, or what goes on in the midst of this, is something is what we call as micro skills okay now uh, to to give you an explanation of what micro skills is um uh, i'm just going to take you to my next slide okay right okay now if um so let's take an example of what we do mean by by micro skills um for example let's suppose the engine of your your um, vehicle stopped okay your the engine of your car has stopped um so what would you need to get it working again? Um, you're, you're going somewhere and it stops in the middle of the road. You need something to get it working again. Okay. So the first thing probably you will need is someone who is skilled uh, to work on your car. So somebody like a mechanic, maybe you'll call someone or you'll try and find and locate a mechanic to come in and have a look at your car. Right. Uh, you this guy will need to have the right kind of tools or let's say you don't need a mechanic. You're the one who is there. You may require the right kind of tools to open the engine and work on whatever is going on. You know, you're looking at maybe certain loose wires or certain parts or something that you need to do to ensure that uh, you get the car back working. The third thing you will need is some conditions. You, are, you need to activate certain conditions um, in order for your car to start working. Maybe you need to charge your battery or you may need to uh, add some distal water or probably there isn't a petrol. So, so you need to take your car through some kind of a conducive condition to get it to start working. Okay. Now, similarly, this is what micro skills is like. The, the first thing is there. Uh, the, a counselor needs to have certain skills that is necessary in order to build that counseling relationship. So you need to have those basic foundational skills that is required to build a relationship and to help the person go from A point to a B point. You also need certain tools on what the uh, on on what the outcome you know it's the the tools that you use is dependent um, uh, on the outcome sorry the outcome is dependent on the tools so you need certain tools to ensure that you allow the person to go from A to B and you also need to create certain conditions which bring about those positive changes in the counseling so when we look at micro skills it's a set of skills. It's a set of tools that you use, and it's also bringing about a certain environment or a condition that helps your counselee move from a certain place to, to another place. Okay, So uh, wh why is micro skills used? It is used to in order to help build a good relationship and engage the, uh, the counselee in the sessions that, are, that, that will turn to be helpful. So it is used... Um, mainly and importantly to build a good relationship and to engage them in those sessions. And who uses it? It's used by the counsellor to improve the communication, to improve the ability for the counsellee to explore, to understand and to come to a place of action. And to give you a, a definition of it, what is it? They are obs uh, observable actions of the counsellor 
that appear to affect a change in the session. Now, it, it's just not actions. When we mean by actions, it's it has a lot to do with um, not just what you do, but even what you say, how you behave. So it is uh, an all-encompassing word when you look at actions. They are observable things that you consciously do or you consciously say, or you consciously are in a state of being that helps the uh, uh, the counselee to come into a positive sense of a change. So there are different kinds of micro skills that we are going to be learning through the next couple of weeks. Um, and, and I've labeled four, but we're going to be looking at, uh, I think the, the, there's also the fifth one. So the first one is the attending skills we're looking at, which is what we're going to be doing today. The responding skills, the skills of questioning, the skills of influencing or facilitating and personalizing skills. Okay, so these are the five skills that we will look into over detail. Now, this, all of these skills um, focus on, as I was saying, um, not just your words, but on the way that um, you you are alongside your counselee, on the way that you respond on the way that you add how you question them in the way that you bring about certain influential ways of helping them to think to bring about different perspectives these are all what micro skills are are about okay so we're going to be looking at the first one today and that's what we call as uh, attending skills okay i hope uh, I hope we are there. I'm just a little concerned because this, are, are we are we all on the call? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to be looking at uh, attending skills uh, today. So what do you uh, look at the word attending and tell me what do you think it means? What is the what do you mean to attend? What's the meaning of attend? To give listening ear to who is speaking, to be there, to be okay. consciously attentive. Okay, to be attentive, to be there, um, to give a listening ear, to just uh, to be present. Okay, so it is just not being present in body, but being pre present in your uh, in your observation, in your mind. <laughs> In your body, it's being it's being present. So the word attend, very very simple word, you know, like how it comes from the word of paying attention. So that's what you do. That's what that's what it means. It means to attend or to uh, to focus on on a person. Okay. So when we look at um, the purpose of attending skills, it is encouraging. It is your your. Uh, the the counselee counselor is in an environment or is in a place or is in a st state of uh, attention or being that encourages the counselee to talk, okay, and shows that the counselor is interested in what's being said. So that's the purpose of attending skills. That two things twofold. One, it encourages them to talk, and it shows that you are interested in what is going on, okay. Um, Okay, sorry. Yeah. So when is it used? Attending skills is used throughout the entire counseling process. Okay, it's not something that, uh, you know, it's not just like you attend to them only when they walk into the room, but you're also attending to them as they are, uh, as they're speaking throughout the entire process, especially very important during the initial stages of establishing rapport. Now, that's remember, you know, the, the your first impression is your best impression. You've heard of that, right? So uh, now this is not to make an impression, but it is to demonstrate to the counselee that you are interested, that you are glad that they have come, that you are there to be as a helping partner with them. Okay, so although it is used through the entire counseling process, it is mainly important during the stages of um, the initial rapport building. What does it mean? Like we said, it means paying attention to what 
the counselee, again, that word's been missing, okay, the, uh, what the counselee is saying and doing or what is being said and what is being done by the counselee, okay? So it's paying attention to what the counselee is doing. Now, when we look at attending skills, there are um, three ways or three kinds that, uh, uh, three ways or three uh, yeah, maybe three types is, is what I'd, I'd probably just put that as uh, kinds of attending. Okay, so you attend non-verbally and verbally. You attend by listening and you attend by observing. Now, we will go through each of this in detail. So attending is not just what you say, but it's also what you don't say. So that would a lot mean by your own body language. Attending is by listening. Attending also is by observing. Like, for example, there are there are many times that you can just observe something. And when you make a comment or when you make a response, um, they, you know, you know that you're being paid attention to. Right. So in counseling, especially, we are looking at these three types of these three ways of how one can attend. So when we attend non-verbally and verbally, what does this mean? Um, this refers to, and, and I think it's it's just an easier way to remember, uh, think of it as three Vs and one B. Three Vs and one B. The three Vs being um, visual, vocal, verbal, plus your plus the person's body language okay so um like we said attend uh, uh, an attending behavior is supporting your counselee um with uh, with ways that are individually appropriate also culturally appropriate okay so i think that's something that we need to also be careful about depending on the kind of culture that that we come from and uh, um, how we how we manage to attend uh, people like for example in some cultures a handshake is not something that is um, that may be culturally very appropriate Right. So, for example, in India, there may be certain groups of people, um, especially women, will not extend their hands for a handshake. OK. Um, uh, and, and so we've got to be culturally careful and understanding uh, when we when we actually make that sense of when we when we progress into a behavior like that. OK. Now, these three Vs. Uh, uh, and Bs. So let's let's um, what are these aspects? really emphasize they emphasize that certain gestures or certain actions or things that we say uh, help in building a relationship in in being able to create a sense of a bond to the uh, to the counselee okay so let's move with the first v which is a visual which is the eye contact and this is fairly simple and this i'm sure you know we've learned in in different uh st through different stages of life as to how what we need to do what we need to do so paying attention uh, one of the things we need to do is maintaining a good eye contact maintaining a good co eye contact what does it convey it conveys interest it conveys involvement it conveys confident in confidence in the story of the counseling. So a good eye-to-eye -eye contact really helps to ensure that someone is listening. Now, that doesn't mean you stare, okay? That, you know, it doesn't mean that you, you know, you have to keep your eyes so focused on them that you can't look left or right. That doesn't, it doesn't mean that. So you have a healthy way of building that kind of a uh, contact, okay? So, so the eye contact, uh, is is needed so much so that you give natural breaks in your uh, in your eye contact okay uh, now why is that necessary is one is i think it helps the counselee not to feel so intimidated that someone is looking deep into their eyes okay uh, for the other for also the understanding that there may be counselees who have difficulty with just maintaining eye to eye contact with that kind of a closeness um, uh, that that they may feel. So what you're doing is you're demonstrating uh, 
attention when you are speaking to the counselee, but also not making them feel uncomfortable. So that's why you have natural um, uh, breaks in your eye contact. There should be more of an, you know, like an ebb and flow as you collect your thoughts and listen to their story. So, you know, as you listen and while you're talking, you can look somewhere else and then look back. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, look that intimidating. Okay, um, it's good to when even when you are talking to your counselee to notice those uh, those uh, breaks in eye contact um, in the in the counselee because it it sometimes you find that they may tend to look away when they are discussing certain topics so they may kind of close their eyes or they may be looking down. It suggests uh, it, it helps you understand many things. Okay, so looking for that also uh, gives you clues about what probably are things that they may be finding um, difficult to 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 share. Okay, now while listening, it is uh, it uh, you know so um, what, what we kind of sometimes follow is to uh, is the triangle. So it's. Although it's great to maintain that eye contact when you talk to a person, however, like I said, it can become uncomfortable. And um, that is if you, you know, if you tend to just uh, deeply focus into their eyes. So to combat this, th there's something called as a triangle. So you break eye contact every five seconds or so. So and when breaking the eye contact, you know, uh, don't. Um, you know, it's it's better you don't look down because it may um, it may look as if you know you're you're a little um, flustered or you're you're getting a little nervous. Okay, what you can do is often looking towards the side as if you're remembering something rather than looking down. Okay, uh, so uh, another way of doing that is to be able to focus on a triangle. That is. From one eye to the eye, other eye to the chin, back to one eye to the other eye to the chin. So then, you know, uh, you will you will find that, you know, if, uh, th that can become quite relaxing also for for your counselee. I mean, a lot of people have asked me, what are you going to do? Are you going to be listening to them or are going to be doing this triangle? But I think that happens and that that will come pretty naturally as you continue to do some of that uh, to to practice that. Okay. Uh, also, to be sensitive in how you express um, eye contact uh, across cultures and genders. Okay, um, so being being careful of of how you do that, especially when it is towards an opposite gender. Okay, so 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 that it doesn't one become uncomfortable or or it could it doesn't seem as if uh, you know it is it's uh, it's false or it's put on okay so that's the that's what we look at at uh, the first v which is visual the second is vocal now <coughs> excuse me you may be wondering you know why is it so important to focus on these things i can't i you know i can't tell you enough the power of uh, some of these these skills um just um, um, I, I, the reason why I'm saying this is because, uh, you know, in the last two years, uh, I, I've done a lot of um, telephone sessions and a lot of um, uh, online sessions. OK, and uh, there, you know, when, when you're in a space like this, you don't have the physical presence to help your counselee experience um, the warmth or the concern or the care that you would like to show them. And all that you have is, you know, maybe your face and you have your voice, right? And of course, the, the words you use are different that we'll come to later. And um, the very fact that you can, you know, God's given you a voice that can actually help create a sense of soothing or, or a sense of, feeling more relaxed, um, especially when the counselee seems very agitated or very, um, you know, held up or extremely overwhelmed is, is a good thing. And, um, you know, so making use of that. And, uh, you know, you'd, you'd understand and you'd know that your emotions are something that is um, conveyed via your tone of voice, okay? 
your excitement can come from your tone of voice or, you know, just for the fact that you're being empathetic, that you're there. I don't know if you figure that, you know, I'm trying to modulate my voice for you to see that you convey a lot through through your voice, your pitch, the pacing, the volume can all have such an effect on how a counselee responds emotionally back to you. Okay, so your voice can do so much to help create that, that sense of soothing, that sense of regulating those overwhelming emotions that they have. Okay, and uh, what you're attempting to do is you're attempting to communicate that warmth and interest and not boredom or a lack of caring. And, uh, and and I'm sure a lot of you all have been witness to this when, you know, I'm not against doctors at all. I think they're, they're great at their jobs, but they are sometimes so overworked that you don't feel a connection. They may be excellent at their... Uh, at their skill or at their diagnosis or at, uh, you know, a better outcome. But uh, a relational skill is something very often I see doctors missing, you know, just that ability to calm and to assure you. And a lot of times, you know, patients come back saying, you know, the doctor was you know, I, I felt half my illness went away when I spoke to the doctor. I'm, I'm sure you all. Am I resonating with you all or am I just going off on a tangent? Yes, no, thumbs okay. up. Everything is fine, Pastor. You're okay. okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So 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 it's it's important to you know know that especially in counseling that becomes uh your voice is like you know often that is used as a tool to help. So keeping care about that so it, it really depends on what your your counselee is talking about then you know you kind of modulate your pitch your pace and your volume now silence often can be a very powerful tool as well well okay and i think um uh, uh, you know, counselors, when they just begin to start, they feel a sense of pressure that there shouldn't be any silence in that 45 minutes, one hour that I'm talking. There shouldn't be any silence. You know, the, something or the other should keep going because that's how we are so wired that unless somebody is talking or communicating, there is something that is absent. Often a silence can be very, very useful. I have a lot of uh, counselees, you know, who take at least a good 10 seconds before they can bring out the next line. So they will say something and they will pause. And then they will say something and they will pause. So do not be pressured, one, to fill that up, okay? The Fill the silence up, allow the silence, okay? Even at times, maybe when they are... Um, extremely emotionally overwhelmed and somebody's sobbing, someone's crying, uh, that becomes a powerful tool to just help them see through that and encouraging them to bring out those emotions. Remember, they are showing the emotions here because they find it a safe place. And often you will have counselees telling you, I'm so sorry that I cried. I'm so sorry that I broke down. And I always encourage them. I said, you know, I'm encouraging you to do that. I'm, and I know that is a release for you. So please go ahead and uh, and bring those emotions out. If you need to cry for a couple of minutes, you know, I'm here just to help and to support you through that. So, so silence can be a very uh, powerful therapeutic tool. There's something called as verbal underlining. What is this? It is where you give an uh, uh, an emphasis to certain words or phrases that they are trying to convey. OK, so you may they may be saying um, uh, it was really difficult and, you know, it, it helps saying that, yeah, uh, I can see that. Or, yeah, it, really difficult, wasn't it? You know, it sounds like it. something that just helps to give a, an emphasis to some words or to to certain phrases that they may be saying. Now, you don't have to parrot it after every sentence. It's really done at a time when maybe they are really talking about something that is that is uh, um, that is strongly uh, that that they feel um, uh, difficult about. OK, the next one is verbal tracking. Now, verbal is, of course, what uh, you use as words. Now, when we look at verbal 
uh, one of the key skills in verbal uh, attending is tracking. That is, you are following the counselee stories. The goal of verbal tracking is to keep the dialogue going where the uh, client leads rather than where you want to go. Okay, so when they're talking uh, and they're going through one, like for example, the, the counselor is telling you all about his home. Okay, and they're going off on that to say, this is how my father is, this is how my mother is, and this is how I am, and this is how an issue is, all of that. Okay, and they're taking it there and suddenly maybe you interject and say, how do you feel at work? Okay, so remember that has that story has stopped halfway, and you've kind of kind of begun the some um, begun something else. Now this is important usually at the beginning of counseling because this is a period or a time where the counselee is making their first impression of you as a counselor, and often we see that counselors in training begin to start formulating this question in their mind regarding the counseling counselee stories and actually miss the real dialogue that can that can maybe prove helpful um, in understanding their true stories okay so uh, um, ensure that that you go along with the story of the of the counselee now often um, you know, in initial sessions, your counselee should be doing most of the talking of about, like we said, 80% and 20% is left to the counsellor. This, this skill uh, of verbal tracking is picking up where counsellees leave off. So often, you know, what counsellees do is they pause or they complete part of their stories. And, um, you know, so so you often need to resist that temptation to ask too many questions or redirect the stories until uh, you know the counselees have had the opportunity to fully and completely have having spoken about it okay uh, and the best way to do that is to stay focused and urge them to continue using this thing called this minimal uh, encouragers and that is uh huh mm hmm yeah oh okay right now these are ways that you're saying yeah i'm with you go on and i'm sure a lot of us use this okay but it is to um to uh, ensure that you stay on topic um with the counselee and not interrupt or change those topics abruptly okay so this is something that that again is is important um do we have any questions up until now I think it's fairly simple, but any, yes, yes, Shay. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to give a contribution pertaining to focus on the eye. I just had mm -hmm. another um, perspective to that, that sometimes when you don't want to look too much on the eye, I was taught years ago during when I was prepped for an interview that I could mm -hmm. just look at the nose of the interviewer it will, look, it will look like as if my eye is on the, I'm having eye contact. So you can switch bit from the eyeball to the nose, to the tip of the nose of right. who you're talking to, and then go back again to the eye if you want to take breaks. Just just an addition, I think, to what yeah. you've told us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Shay. Yeah, that's exactly what the triangle is, either the eyes or the, uh, sorry, the nose or the mouth. Yes, absolutely. That's right. Uh, yes, Samuel. <clears throat> Um, but I can't help but think um, how much of this, uh, and I think I mean it's a broader question than than um, than the process of attending, uh, which is um, I am imagining when um, counselees come, uh, there is sort of a skepticism that they hold as well like will this person really be able to understand or help me like you know sometimes when we go to a doctor we have certain skepticism uh, we tend to look at credentials we tend to look at how the doctor is talking to us uh, mm -hmm. his tone of voice confidence and all that and while we're doing all of this while we're maintaining eye contact using silence 
uh, using body language. I'm also thinking the things that are happening inside the mind, which is it's almost like a mind game. I'm sorry for using that, but that that just that's something that keeps coming. Where as a counselor, I'm trying to I'm trying to get the counselee to say what like the 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 really the core of the thing, and the counselee is. Uh, probably saying okay let this person bring it out or i don't know so just that that tug of war that that does that happen like is that is is i i i want to say that hap that probably has happened so so i think the the struggle the point of struggle is um while this person is here uh, with me sharing the space and uh, things would be a lot easier if we just collaborated and said like we're on the same team and let's tackle the problem versus mm. uh, it's almost like a tug of war where you, you know like i give something you take something i give something so so that where it's like it's almost like playing a chess uh, with mm. the counselor so so is there a danger of that and and how do you kind of overcome get past that where it's not me versus the counselor but it's um, us versus the problem Hmm. So what what your attempt now um uh, I I think I'd make a comment on what you said first yes there are a large number of people who are coming uh with a huge skepticism as to see what am I going to face here or what are you going to bring differently from what I've tried earlier okay so yes you will have a large number of people coming with that kind of a mindset yet you will have those who come in here who Mm, are more than willing to just find a space to to bear you out okay now i think the initial contact becomes very crucial because they're trying you out in the sense of they they're trying to see whether this person fits my bill okay and uh, when you are attending what you are doing is saying i am not in a one up position from you i and you are working together now when does a person feel one up is when you're kind of uh, uh, you know you're you're suggesting okay tell me whatever is your problem the problem becomes like a symptom list or like a complaint list and there isn't anything outside of the problem that the either the counselor or the helper is connecting to like often you would see in a doctor's office what is your complaint okay you have a headache you have this you have that you have this go take that there is nothing else about you know uh maybe a sense of encouragement or a sense of care or sense of don't worry we have it handled or uh, you know you've come at the right time i'm sure this has been hard for you but uh, you know i want to you know just just stay hopeful now all of that is this what we are calling as attending in lay terms so that becomes very crucial for the counselee to drop their guard and um when you're attending you're not doing it just to win over the counselee yes that is part of it that is you you're attempting to build a rapport so that they know that they have a space where they can be completely honest and open and direct about what they're going through rather than staying guarded okay and one way of doing that is while you are attending you are showing them that hey i am not the a uh, expert of your life you are the expert of your life and that's why i want to understand what you know of yourself okay so that alongside with you i can uh, you and i can work together to find out uh, you know we can partner together participate together to find out what are the right choices for you okay or you're showing them that you know at the end you're responsible for the choices that you make but i'm here to support and walk alongside with you so this attending becomes extremely important to do just for one for them to drop their guard for them to just feel a sense of ease um within this new relationship and for a sense to know that you know i've i've come to a place where i can at least voice out what i'm going through so that's why that it that's what attending actually does it isn't something that you're doing to just win over the client uh, the counselee you're doing this for for these reasons that that i did mention also 
I hope I answered that, Samuel. You <clears> did. <throat> you did, Pastor, to some extent. I'm. I can't have a. I'm thinking. Um, Samuel, sorry, I lost you. Samuel? Okay, I think we lost Samuel. Or am I lost? Uh, am I audible? Yes, Pastor. Okay, yes, okay. Yes, I, think, I think yes, you are. I think we lost Samuel. All right. Okay. So we'll 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 go on and uh, maybe hear from him once he's back. Okay. <clears throat> so the the next we spoke about the three Bs and we're talking about the one B, right? Now it's that's the B is the body language. Now what is the body language? The body language is where you describe uh, what is described as the. Uh, whatever you see non-verbally, whatever you see, um, uh, the non-verbal messages that you send uh, through to the client, to the counselee, through your posture, through the gestures, through your facial expressions, through your appearance, and all of this conveys your interest and your involvement. Okay, and uh, often uh, uh, when when when, uh, when you demonstrate a positive body language through either a relaxed posture or a steady eye contact or certain nods of the head or an occasional smile or you know a happy expression um, it, when you do that it really helps in connecting to to the other person <clears throat> and uh, you know even um, like for example uh, we do okay I, yeah that's there the the example of mirroring okay what does mirroring mean is that the, the kind of posture or the or the uh, appearance uh, when I mean by appearance not what he's wearing but the kind of seating position or the you know the way that he's he's probably kept his arms opened or you know being sitting back kind of helps you also figure out that you know number one you get to understand and observe what's going on there but when you mirror it like when they seem relaxed you also seem a lot more relaxed when they you know tend to lean forward and and talk to you you also show that intensity that kind of helps to create a sense of um openness and a, a sense of being just just um uh, assisting them to to uh, to either relax or to include in their set of skills some kind of a non-verbal behavior that you're that you're showing. Okay, um, uh, and often this begins with the counselor being able to create a sense of a relaxed posture. So when you yourself adopt a relaxed or a, a, a relaxed posture or you know you tend to lean slightly forward showing your interest or you use good gestures like like head nods or you know you know um, your your brows your eyebrows going uh, cross when when she is talking about something cross or you know your face lightening up when when they are saying something that really helps to um, uh, help the client to to continue the conversation okay so to, to be able to do that you know to be able to have a command over your your own body language and being able to also attend to the body language of the other person really works now physical distance i think physical um, it it is good and it is appropriate that there is some kind of um, a comfortable distance between you and your counseling. I mean, you know, not sitting too close or standing too close. Often an arm's length is what is generally, even, even for normal interactions, you, you don't like someone, you know, standing right across your face. Um, but then, you know, you have a certain, uh, certain distance uh, as, as you are um, uh, talking to them. So all of this, although looks really simple, but I think can can bring about a whole lot of difference in the way that uh, that that you attend to them. Okay, yeah. So you adopting uh, a relaxed, attentive body posture, leaning forward slightly, using good gestures, uh, having uh, an appropriate physical appearance. I think even to be 
you know, not too flashily dressed or not too shabbily dressed, but being appropriate in the way that you dress, having a certain sense of physical distance and mirroring as I spoke about. Okay. So one of the things that, uh, you know, and you will find this in a lot of places is generally for attending non-verbally, you use this acronym called a SOLER, which is S is sitting squarely facing the person. All right. O is to um, have a non-defensive body posture. Uh, L is leaning slightly towards the counselee. I is a good co uh, eye contact. And R is a relaxed and a comfortable um, way of being seated. Okay. So th this is something, again, that's that's quite general, but but fairly helpful to, to work through. Okay. So before we close for a break, uh, let's probably just... Um, Take an example and, uh, you know, I want to open this out to y'all to figure out what, how is it that y'all would like to, um, uh, I, I think we are way off time. Uh, okay, we're 10.50. Okay, good. All right. So uh, shall we shall we come back? And uh, uh, so the slide, I'm going to leave the slide on so you can just probably think about how is it that you're going to respond to Tina? Okay, it's an example that we have. So let's just look at how we're going to respond to Tina and we're going to come back and there are going to be some of us who are going to actually respond to Tina, okay, through through first person responses, all right? Okay, my clock shows 10.51. We'll be back at 11.01. So you can go grab your coffee and come back. Oops. 